Hello CIS 48. In this video I'm going to go over unit 9 notes and assignment. And in this chapter, chapter 9, it talks about network services like DNS, NAT, and DHCP. So we're going to dive a little deeper as we already learned um, in the prior chapters what these are. Um, and we also have done labs to configure DNS, DHCP, and NAT. So here in this particular topology, we would see that we have a client system that will connect to the internet to be able to access a web, web server, which is linked to the DNS. And that DNS would then have the, the hierarchy. So when you're looking at glennclark.com, we would then have the, the DNS root, which is the dot, and then the dot com. And then under that, we would have Glenn Clark. And with that, we would use the DNS on the Microsoft DNS role. And so when you're looking at a URL, like a dot com, you would have the root portion. And then after that, we would have the complete fully qualified domain name in the next level. That would be the name of the actual site, like Glenn Clark. So there are two types of DNS. We would have the internal and external DNS. And these can be set up with zones to separate the internal and external DNS. So internal is within the local area network that can be used as your domain controller um, to be able to manage the network domains itself. So the records would then be set for a specific zone. We can separate them by zone. Now external, that would be put in the DMZ or public, so that way um, the traffic can come in from the public side and be able to access that DNS. Some company would use different domain name for internal and external and set up different zone for that. So we saw how we would create a DNS and be able to configure the zone um, in multiple labs. So here what we can see is we would have internal external zone um, represented or explained in this section. Now you can also have a third party hosted DNS like using AWS you can use virtual machines on the AWS to be able to configure it or use AWS service. They would host your server. Um, your web server can be linked to your DNS. You can use GoDaddy um, and so on. So these company are given a set of public DNS and they would be able to, or public addresses that would be linked to their DNS and be able to host um, and link that DNS to your um, web server. In the hierarchy, you would have the at the top level that will be the parent, and then you would have the subdomains or the child domains. And the zones are inherited from top down. So, um, in the case where if I configure the DNS in the parent uh, level, that zone would then be carried down to the child. Now, if the child can have additional zones, but those zones in the child would not be applied to the parents. For the forward and reverse lookup zone, we would have four lookup zone, um, which is going to be your your uh, your fully qualified name domain name to the IP address. And the reverse lookup zone would be the IP address to the fully qualified domain name. So in the case where if you need to, you can set up the reverse lookup zone. Not all companies use reverse lookup zone, but the majority would mostly use the forward lookup zone. So what you have for the questions um, is for number one, it asks you how can you set up internal external DNS zone? You can separate the zones and the records. Uh, for the internal from the external or you can use different domain names for each of the zones so you can set up different zone and so let's say that I have an external zone 
for my external DNS, and then I would have the internal zone for the internal DNS. So you can have separate zone for and separate records for each type of DNS. For number two, the difference between forward and reverse lookup zone is that the for lookup zone uses the fully qualified domain name like www.google.com and that will be connected to Google public IP address. And so um, the reverse lookup zone is then the IP to the fully qualified domain name. For number three, Describe the role of the primary and the secondary DNS zone. So we would have a primary zone. Primary zone is going to contain a writable copy of the DNS database. And the DNS database would contain its records. The secondary DNS zone would then be a, only a read copy of the database, which is received from the primary DNS zone. So the copy of it can be used in the case that we need to reference what would be in the primary zone. So it's, it is just a read-only backup of the, the primary. So you can create different type of zone in that you would specify what kind of zone that you're creating, whether it's primary, what which is a rewritable copy, and then the Secondary, that means when it's writable, that means it's just able to update and store additional information. The secondary DNS zone is going to be just a read only copy of the primary. So, in your notes, um, it talks about the primary and the secondary DNS zone on the bottom of page one going into page two. And the secondary DNS zone can be used to answer the DNS query from the client to help the primary DNS server. So um, in that case, we might have multiple type of zone to be able to support the need um, for the inquiry from our client system in a very large network. And you also see what's called the Active Directory Integrated Zone or the AD Integrated Zone. This contains your DNS records and that means that the records can be updated on any domain controller and the DNS data would be replicated with the AD at replication. So I can update one, one of the, the, all the records on one of the DNS zone and then be able to use Active Directory to replicate it to other domains or other child domains in the network hierarchy. Now, um, DNS records would consist of different types. So when we create the DNS and the DNS zone, it will create the records accordingly. How is it going to be able to map your fully qualified domain name to the IP? is going to rely on some of the records. So host A is going to be used to resolve the fully qualified domain name to an IP. And so when you were setting up the zone, it asks you what IP address is your DNS and what is the fully qualified domain name you want to use. So that is going to create the host A. The host quadruple A is an alias record that's used to create the record that has the name that point to another host record. So you can have many records with different names which points to the same IP. Think of it like a nickname, um, which is your, your, your alias is a nickname and then your host quadruple A is to resolve fully qualified domain name to IPv6. So alias is just a nickname. You can give it many different nicknames, but it's gonna go back to the IP. Um, exchange is used for mail exchange. It points to the inbound email server that's going to be used to get the email from the outside to the, the inside email server and then eventually to your mailbox using Active Directory association with that user account. 
Um, so if you send an email to mary at company.com, the DNS query is sent to company.com to see if there is a, an email server. If it sees an MX record, then it's going to be able to forward right, the, the email to that particular server and then eventually the email server and then tie that to Mary who is on uh, as a user on the network through Active Directory. Your name server is used to specify authoritative domain where to find the IP address. So think of it as a way to identify which DNS server on the domain that will be uh, that would have that IP address. Star Authority SOA is it's going to store the DNS zone as an increment number in which the version and the increments at any time of the zone change. So when you update the zone, right? Startup Authority is going to be able to store the changes, and if it has a different increment number than the second DNS, then it's going to copy that zone to the secondary DNS. So that's how it's able to distinguish if there has been changes from the primary. If the primary has been modified, then it's going to create that copy to the secondary DNS zone. For the pointer, PTR is used for the reverse lookup zone. So when you create a reverse lookup zone in the lab, it creates the PTR record, which associates IP address to fully qualified domain name. So to create record, you simply just create the zone and the zone is gonna encompass a number of records depending on the type of zone that you create. Naming the zone, we want to use the do domain information and we want to also configure the zone to the IP address because it uses the IP address to, to store that information in the records. Uh, Dynamic DNS is a protocol that allows the system to contact the DNS and update their own records. So it dynamically updates the information on the DNS. Um, now Windows Server use you can use tool going into DNS management console. You can look up each, you can go into the for lookup zone and then you can choose the property of the DNS zone and you can set secure and non-secure dynamic updates. And we've seen some of this in the lab. Public dynamic host solution, um, basically that's just available publicly. It can be used to update uh, DNS dynamically for the public DNS and it can be configured with the dynamic IP address using DHCP uh, service. With dynamic DNS um, the agent would need to be installed either as a system or the router to dynamically up the DNS, update the DNS. On the DHCP dynamic host control protocol this allows you to lease addresses to a certain uh, all, or the systems that are connected to the network. We would create a scope which contains the range of the IP address and sometimes this would refer to a pool of IP address. Um, in the configuration, we would set up the default gateway. That's how it's able to use the router to get the IP address to where that system would be in the case where if it is external to your subnet. And um, the DNS address, we want to be able to use the DNS address to be able to identify if the system is part of a certain uh, area of the network and that domain. Um, so when we create that pool, it's gonna use the group of IP addresses in that pool to be able to lease to the group of systems that would be requesting that. So when the system requests for an IP address, first it's going to broadcast to all the system and it's going to say, are, it's going to say, are you a DHCP server? I need an IP address. 
And if we have at least one DHCP server, it's gonna, the DHCP server is going to respond, yes, I am an, a DHCP server. I can give you an IP address. Then the client system would then ask, would this be, so it's, it's going to offer the IP address. Then the client system would say, okay, I can use this IP address. And, and so after that, the server would confirm and say, yes, this is the lease of the IP address. It's going to expire at a certain time and it's going to give the expiration date. So there is a, there are, there are four ways in the DHCP connection. So there are four ways that four things that are happening when a client requests for an IP address. So make sure we know discover, offer, request, and acknowledgement because CompTIA A plus will ask you about that. Um, for the DHCP discover, we had mentioned that about the broadcast, the offer, the request, and the acknowledgement. So you can go through the section to take a look closer on what each of that process entails. So in the um, number three, we already talked about primary and the secondary. Number four, we want to identify the type of DNS records based on the given function functionalities. We have um, DNS server, which is authoritative in the domain, where to find the I domain's IP address. That will be your NS or your name server. So it's going to really identify uh, the IP address of the domain itself using the NS record or the name server record. The, for question B, when you create a record that has the name that points to another host record, that will be your C name. And then for C, to create the reverse lookup zone that's associated with IP address with the DNS server and for the reverse lookup, that means fully qualified name to the IP, we would use a PTR record or the pointer record. And for D, store settings in the DNS zone, such as increment number, which acts as the version number for the increment anytime zone changes, that will be your SOA. So number five, the type of protocols that allows the system to contact DNS server and update their own records will be your dynamic DNS. And for six, what is DHCP scope? We can say that that is a range of IP address that the DHCP server would can lease to the client. For number seven, what type of ad of address is used in the DHCP discover message Y. So it uses the broadcast address, which are all Fs, and this is used to send to all the system to identify um, and obtain the response from DHCP. So basically when it broadcasts, it's just saying, hey, are you a DHCP server? Can you give me an IP address? And it, because it's not sure who or which system would be the DHCP. That's why it needs a broadcast and therefore it would use a broadcast address. For question eight, what happens after the clients received an IP address offer from the DHCP server? Um, that will be that the DHCP server would then send a final acknowledgement message, which indicates the client that the lease time for any of the IP address options uh, or the lease time and any of the additional information, just as the router address and the DNS server address. And so therefore, when we look at the IP configuration, right, uh, we would see that type of information. If you do IP config all, you would see the lease time, the DHCP and the DNS information. For number nine, what type of system is used for to forward and this, the discover message to a DHCP server from a client in a different network? You would use what's called a DHCP relay or the IT help, the IP helper. So here in the next section after it talks about time to live, which is the length of time that the client would have uh, the IP address assigned by the DHCP server, um, that would just 
be a specific period of time that it would stay alive um, to have the IP address assigned. For the reservation in the DHCP, we can reserve a certain IP address um, by using or the MAC address to a certain given computer. So it will always get that same address every single time uh, instead of, you know, getting changed to that address. The relay is used to forward the discover message to uh, from a certain server to a client system that's in a different network. We can use the relay or in Cisco that's considered the IP helper and that allows the Cisco router to relay the message to the appropriate DHCP server so it can offer the IP address to the right system that would be on a different network. Now to disable the non-DHCP UDP message, you can use the no IP forward protocol, which allows the, we, we would stop that, the UDP message from being forwarded. Okay. For NAT, NAT is a network address translation. It allows us to translate private to public IP address. In your home network, you are sharing one IP address, and so NAT is used for all the systems that's connected on that network. So we would use everybody, everybody would use that one IP address to connect to the internet. Now that is helpful in that it would hide all the IP schemes within the network and not be exposing that information um, to the outside. So before it sends that out the packets, it would strip down all the source IP address information and it would use the public IP to be able to send it. So as it would be leaving your wireless router at home or the network router, it would not contain the internal IP address information. When the packets come back, when it hits that area, then it's going to then use the router to be able to get to a certain part of the network and then the switch would be able to identify the system based on the frame with the map. For the static NAT that would allow us to use multiple public IP addresses and it would map one public to one IP. So in the illustration there, that's what you would see. Um, and in the case where in the network, an enterprise network, you might have multiple, multiple public IP. That's how you're able to use static NAT. And so a NAT device can have multiple public IP addresses that will be assigned to that. So whether it is a router or another appliance, we would use a NAT device and link configure that device to use multiple public IP addresses and we would map one to one, one private to one public. Um, it would also have multiple network adapter and in the lab when we saw that we couldn't configure the, where the Windows server for, for NAT and remote access routing um, in that it doesn't have the no multiple network adapter. So you would need multiple network adapter to make it functional as a router. And in the router, it's able to route using and in the router itself would have multiple adapter. Network, net overloading uses one public IP address for all the internal system. And so it would use what's called the port address translation or PAT, which translate the source port address. Um, and an IP address. So the device records definition, uh, destination for the address and the port is based on the request. It's stripped down the source IP information like what we've seen with the original NAT information from the above page. Now, um, in the Cisco router, we would use the access list, which permits IP address and subnet mask it uses the permit command, which control uh, that particular IP address based on 
what's configured from the access list. So in the configuration for that, you would need to establish a source list to one interface and that allows the internal addresses to be able to be linked to um, one public address, okay? So on the router, you can configure that to be NAT overloading and we simply just make sure that we provide all the addresses on the source list that will be linked to one interface which use the public IP. Port forwarding is a way that we would configure the network appliances to forward packets to the system on the DMD, which is the internal network. And it will, we would use it to block the packets from the internet to enter the network. Um, so now we can use rule settings technique to specify the type of traffic for forward and based on characteristics such as IP address, destination, and packets. For a proxy server, that will be, we can set up proxy to be transparent or non-transparent, and proxy are network devices. We can configure that as a default gateway to pass data, or we can also, it can also be consist of applications that point to the proxy server. So the type of proxy servers are, it can be NAT proxy servers, which implement NAT services for all the requests that's coming from the client systems to translate public and private IP. It can be used for uh, authentication and authorization for the user or the systems that's on the network. We can also use proxy to restrict sites certain website, you often see this in school district where they would use it to protect the kids from accessing um, sites that are not age appropriate. Um, and then we can use proxy to set up protocol rules, which allows or disallow a certain type of protocols. Um, and it's a way that we can filter or block. And we can content filter using proxy. Certain content can be prevented. Caching, we can cache certain web pages on the disk and the data will be returned to S page. Don the reserve proxy, it allows the internet to send requests on the internal web server and pass to the proxy server to verify and making sure that that can be forwarded to the requested internal web server. So reserve proxy is often used. Um, we can use it to protect our web server um, by using the, the verification and forwarding requests of, of certain traffic to the internal web server. So unified communication or known as UC, you need to know these technologies for CompTIA A+. Um, we would have voice over IP and those could be phones. Um, and so that would be using IP network for voice or phone communication. Video, we would see video streaming or video watching video uh, that could be live. Uh, desktop sharing, we would see that with Zoom and also instant messaging that will be also live. So all of these live communication type of system, we need to have live services. And with the live services, you need to make sure that the system have the presence capability to be able to show that the, the user or the object is available or unavailable. Um, it uses multicast or unicast technology. Unicast is gonna be one-to-one, -one, so, Voice over IP phones can use the unicast or multicast. So in the school environment, when you have an announcement where it would send to all the speaker to the classroom that will be multicast, and then unicast, we, would, we can make a phone call from one to one system. The configuration would then be recommended depending on the bandwidth. So of course, multicast is gonna require more bandwidth than 
what you see but also if you have a lot of unicast that is also going to consume right quite a bit of bandwidth as well so to really accommodate bandwidth we would then look at performance and quality of service we need to know qos what it is so quality of service ensures that the user is going to have good experience with with the technological performance that we have enough the appropriate network throughput um, your traffic shaping and to really limit the flow so the class of service your your cos which is a lay, the second layer of the QoS service, it uses the priority code point, which is a way that it sets a priority for a certain type of service that would be we first. So in a voice environment, if, you, if you're making a phone call and there's a lag in the phone call where you're not gonna be able to hear, or when you're on Zoom and you know when in the in the case where the network is deteriorating and you you are unable to see or hear the user, then in that case we have a poor quality of service. So what the system will do, we can set it to make sure that we would have a certain priority setting, so that way it can accommodate a certain type of service first. We would have this serve, which is differential services. This is a protocol for when you can shape the traffic. So we can dedicate more of the bandwidth to a certain type of traffic and reduce the bandwidth for less important traffic. And that's what call traffic shaping. Now differentiated service code point, your DSCP, it's a field in version four and version six IP header that is going to be designed to identify what type of traffic that is so that way we can utilize the traffic shaping technique to really control our outcome and, and improve the performance for the network so when we're looking at you know certain type of service that would be priority we can focus our network traffic based on that and that would be varied from one business to another because certain business value certain applications um, so for example if you're looking at twitch and they're streaming video from their servers um, and live right uh, you can watch the recording or you can watch them live in that case we want to focus more on the streaming video option um, you know the data that's leaving the network as stream videos and the, the type of protocol and the traffic based on that compared to you know other type of services that would be used like file trend uh you know file downloads and so on that can be less of importance compared to what the main income would be or the main revenue would be for a certain type of traffic that would relate to a certain application now the devices on the UC, you can see UC devices could be voice over IP phones. The UC gateways would be your PBX, which is an older type of phone system um, to be, and you would see this in like, you know, your public uh, grade school where they would have the type of phone system and the PBX for announcement. And then you also have UC servers like Microsoft Skype for business that will be a type of UC servers. So to really control and and prevent, allow or deny certain traffic, we can set up based on certain characteristics. From which IP address is that going to? Right, from from a certain IP address to a certain IP address, so source and destination address. We can also look at ports from a certain port to a certain port because in a network communication, we only rely on a few things. We rely on IP addresses to really identify which system that is or MAC address, right? Um, we can also rely on ports, the actual physical communication points of that address and or that system, 
Um, so that port would then be tied, the, the physical port would then be tied to the logical port. So we can use that to deny or allow. And then we can also control with protocol using TCP, UDP, or ICMP. So we can block a certain protocol type of services. We can also block ports. We can also block IPs and MAC. In the distributed switching, you often see this in the virtual environment where we can configure a switch across multiple virtualized systems. So we can use one physical switch and or switches in some case that would allow us to, to communicate across multiple virtual systems. And, and in the virtualized environment, we would see software-defined network, your SDN, which allows us to set up different network identifier or names and IP addresses that would be used for our virtualized network environment. And you would see this more on the cloud, right? Um, so when you set up the, the, the cloud network, it is really a software defined network in that you would define the IP address and so on. So you can have many different networks as represented cloud, but it would be for from you know a certain set of server or maybe one server um, so that way it will be easy to manage <coughs> so in the last few questions for question for question nine what type of system is used to forward discover message for the dhcp server or for the client in different network that will be your dhcp relay or ip helper what type of nat uses multiple public ip addresses that will map one private to one public address that will be static nat what type of nat uses public ip address for all the devices on the network that will be overloading nat and then for the next question which of the following options imply the configuration of the network appliances to forward packets to the system on DMZ or internal network? That will be B, port forwarding. And for number 13, the difference between transparent and non-transparent proxy server in that the transparent proxy server Network devices are configured as default gateway to pass data to the destination system. The non-transparent proxy server consists of application that points to the proxy server. For 14, the type of proxy server based on the given scenario would be A, the server ensures that the user authenticated on the network before allowing of being allowed to access the network internet that will be authentication authorization b the server that allows an internet user to send requests to an internal web server that's passed through the proxy to verify requests and forward the request in the internal web server that will be reserved proxy c the server that blocks access from a certain site based on their content that will be content filter. And then D, the server that contains rules that allows or disallows different internet protocol that will be protocol rules. And for 15, the type of technologies that allow people to communicate in real time, your voice over IP, your video, your desktop sharing, and your instant message. And and your smartphone does most of this or all of it okay 16 the type of qos services that prioritize one type of network traffic by using qos feature to limit flow of a type of traffic while increase the flow of another type of traffic performance is called traffic shaping and for 17, the type of switches that is centrally configured across multiple virtualization system would be known as distributed switch. And then an 18, provide an example of software-defined network 
that will be configuring your network names and IP for virtually connected system. And that concludes all of our questions. Um, that would be for unit nine assignment. So in this unit, we talked about DNS, DHCP, and NAT in the extent of network configuration. We talked about DNS records and zones and how that will play into the dynamic updates. We also talk about DHCP scope and how the DHCP can also use relay to relay the information to the other side of other part of the network, so different networks. And we also talk about NAT and proxy in that we can use public and private address translation in different ways. And we talked about proxy, different type of proxy servers, how we would be able to control access. And then lastly, we talked about quality of service with the universe, universal communication in that we would have real time quality of service and how we would be able to manage network bandwidth and traffic to accommodate those things so we don't have lags in video, voice, or messages. Um, and so, and lastly, we touch on virtualized environment and how we would use SDN to configure our virtual networks for our cloud or our virtualized um, network area using Hyper-V or any kind of hypervisor. And with that, I conclude my lecture for Unit 9. Um, thank you for watching this video and hope to see you in the next lab.